I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the Deputy Director uh, at the CBCA, Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. Uh, and this is one of our live lunch lounges. We've started this event series uh, back in June as a way to support our members, um, keeping the arts top of mind for those member companies and their employees and giving them just one more way to bring the arts into their daily life and make it really easy these are always on the second and fourth Friday of the month, uh, always from noon to 1230, easy to remember. Uh, so that's, that's what we're bringing you today. Um, we have a wonderful partner with us today, uh, James Holmes, who is, um, has a wonderful arts and business background. That's one of the things we love about working with, with James is he's, he's worked professionally in both fields, um, currently uh, working as executive director of the Cherokee Ranch and Castle Foundation, but is also a, a beautiful abstract visual artist and has a, a very inspiring story to share with us about how um, the arts became part of his life. So you are getting a special behind the scenes tour of his studio uh, uh, right in the art district on Santa Fe. Um, James is here to talk to us about his space, his process, his story, actually demonstrate some of his art and painting with us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can take a, a good look. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A. So make sure you have... Um, Make sure you have found the chat feature on your Zoom. Make sure you are chatting to all panelists and all attendees so we can uh, hear your, your comments and thoughts and we'll have a nice little Q&A at the end. For now, for those of you that are joining us live via Zoom, uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to turn it over to James Holmes. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Merida, and also to Rachel for all of your help. Um, we had a good little walk through yesterday, which was fun and also kind of calmed the nerves, <laughs> making sure everything was going to work well. And I appreciate you guys for the invitation. Um, as Meredith had said, uh, we're going to have some fun today. I'm going to share with you a little bit about my story, uh, some of my work, and then uh, towards about the second half of our time together, I want to uh, maybe demonstrate a little bit of my painting technique, uh, working on a painting in my studio, and then uh, answer any questions that anyone may have as we go through the presentation. So I'm gonna turn this around to um, be inside of my uh, gallery portion of my studio. So I'm at the Artist on Santa Fe Gallery at 7th and Santa Fe. And part of what we do is each of the artists that are residents here has a working studio, but also uh, availability to um, set up some gallery work to be able to sell directly to the public. Um, and this is a pretty good representation of the primary um, techniques that I use uh, as I began my painting process and began to mature from being somewhat of a hobbyist at what I was doing to um, really trying to evolve my art practice. And um, this first painting is a painting that was done completely with a palette knife. So I'm gonna try to move in so you can see a little bit of the texture that's in the painting. One of the things that is, I would say a benchmark or a hallmark of my painting style is texture. Um, as Meredith had mentioned, I'm an abstract painter. Um, I paint emotion. I like to say that my painting is a painting that comes from the inside out. And the influences on my work um, can be a, a variety of different things. Um, anything from, you know, interactions I have, you know, with, during the course of my, my personal life or work life, uh, my paintings can be inspired by a conversation that I've had with somebody, an interaction. It can be a result of something that I've read or a movie that I've watched. Uh, the, the subject matter really presents itself literally on its own as I begin my process. And I'll explain that to you once we get into the studio. Um, this painting is the first of the paint brush paintings that I'm showing you. The first two were done with palette knives. I work with palette knives on canvas, with acrylic, and also with uh, paint brushes, mixed media, primarily acrylic, on canvas or board. And this painting is called Transitions Free, and um, it's all done with, um, with brushes.
brushes. And the other uh, hallmark of my work is vibrant color. I love a vibrant color palette. And I often find that the color palette selection is driven by where I'm at in the moment as I begin to actually uh, begin to compose a painting. Uh, this painting is called Painted Sky, and it probably is a good representation of a very bold, uh, very bright uh, color palette that's very much indicative of the kind of work I do. And even though these works, the last three that I've shown you are done with a paintbrush, you can still see that there's a lot of texture in these works. And I accomplished that through layering um, of work either over time and also within a single session. And I oftentimes will paint in a four or five hour session and working in acrylic provides an opportunity for uh, the paint to dry quickly, which then makes it a little bit more workable to be able to go over and create layers. Um, so let's go ahead and go into the studio. A few more of my pieces here in this hallway, but this is my, my uh, sacred space, my sacred creation space, the place where um, I come to create my paintings. When I first started painting in about uh, March of 2018, I uh, painted in the basement of my house and uh, it was a perfectly fine studio uh, for where I was at the time. And I'll share a little bit about that story. Um, what I like to, to say to, to individuals that are looking to pursue their creative interest. And when we talk about having a studio space to create in, um, it is absolutely true that your studio is anywhere where you are making art. <laughs> um, I've got a really great friend who paints on her kitchen counter. Um, I've got friends that like me paint in their basement. Um, I don't think a studio space outside of your home environment is a necessity to be a successful artist. Um, but I, in my case, it followed a particular path uh, and became a logical choice for me to actually move out of my house and into a studio to create my work. So my painting uh, journey, my creative journey started uh, in February of 2018. I was involved in an unfortunate equestrian accident. I've been involved in horses um, since my early 20s. Um, I've jumped and shown horses in the jumper ring uh, over, the, over the years. I've ridden dressage, I've done all kinds of things on horses and never had a serious accident. Um, had a few incidents, but never a serious accident. But on uh, February the 3rd of 2018, I was on a horseback ride. It was a trail ride. So of all things that I've done, they're a little more risky and dangerous on horses. Trail riding is not necessarily one of them. And it was a perfect Saturday afternoon and um, uh, circumstances conspired a situation where the horse that I was training and riding that day became spooked. Um, she very quickly um, unseated me and dumped me. And on the way down to the ground, as she sprinted off to head back to the barn, my head got in the way of her knee and I broke my neck. And um, I didn't in the beginning realize how serious the injury was. I, I dusted myself off, I walked back about a mile and a half back to the stables, got in my pickup truck and drove myself to the hospital. And after um, an X-ray, a CAT scan, an MRI, I overheard a nurse say to my wife, the surgeon is on his way down. And that's the moment I realized that there was a problem and that it was something quite serious. Um, the blessing of that moment was that uh, Dr. Uh, Bradley Duhon at the Parker Adventist Hospital who's the chief neurosurgeon there, happened to be on duty on a Saturday. And um, he sat down with me after evaluating all of the, uh, the testing that had been done and said, James, you're in a very bad situation. You have a very unstable neck and we've got to go in and do emergency surgery tomorrow morning. And that's what we did. Now, what does that have to do with my art journey? Um, after I got out of the hospital um, and was told that I'd be eight to 10 weeks basically sitting in a recliner chair, I was talking to my mom and she said, you know, you're gonna go crazy if you try to sit around for eight or 10 weeks, there's no way you're gonna be able to do that. And suggested that I, as a kid, like to draw and uh, that I like to paint and suggested that I pick up and start drawing. Uh, my wife got home that evening and I explained to her this story and she said, you know, you love horses so much, why don't you try to paint horses? And um, so I began to paint, but what happened to me is there was no expressions 
of what I call figurative work that came out of me. Uh, the things that I was able to create were all these abstract, brilliantly colorful um, expressions that really found a lot of interpretation after the painting was over. So when I would sit down, and it's still my practice today, my, um, my mood or my, what's primarily on my mind will drive a choice of music. I always paint to music. And that then ends up informing the color palette that I end up selecting. And then I literally just lose myself in the work itself. And um, what happens is I typically will come back a day or two after I'm finished a, a painting session and look at that painting and look into it to see what the expression holds for me. I believe that my painting has everything to do with my recovery. And I had the uh, best possible outcome. If you and I hung out together for the next couple of months every day, went hiking, biking, horseback riding, and just generally hung out together, you would have no indication that I had any kind of a injury or any kind of a surgery, which was a significant surgery. Um, just Dr. Duhan did a beautiful job. And I believe art helped me to heal uh, through that period of time. It helped me to keep a positive mental attitude, which is a huge factor in healing your body. And um, that's how my painting journey began. Uh, over time, I began to share out my work on Facebook and the positive feedback from Facebook encouraged me to continue painting. And then as I began to go from really small canvases to much larger canvases, I began to attract into my life new friendships with people that are creative people. And those creative people affirmed uh, what I was doing just by feedback, which encouraged me to continue to push myself as an artist and to grow my work. I had a very fortunate um, uh, opportunity that occurred um, one year after I started painting, almost to the day. Uh, Ann Barheit, who's a Denver area photographer, invited me to exhibit in a show in Parker at a gallery um, called Deep Space Gallery. Uh, she had to talk me into doing it because I really had no intention of showing my work. I and mean, I'd share my work with friends or I would show it out on, on my Facebook page with the thought of actually going out and putting my work up on the walls of a gallery and putting a, assigning a price tag to my work wasn't at all a part of what my thought process was. Um, that led to me meeting another friend, uh, Angel uh, or Espino Arte. He's a Denver artist who introduced me to the Veterans Arts Council here in the Arts District. And that led to me exhibiting there for a year um, ongoing up until the last few months because of the COVID, uh, we're in a pause right now, which then led to me being here in the art district and having my studio. So one thing I wanna, I wanna express and hopefully those of you that are either on an artistic path or you may have had the desire to explore your own creativity is to try to think about the things you did as a child that brought you joy, that were creative. I believe that creativity is a God-given gift. I believe we all have it. I believe over time it gets suppressed within some individuals if it's not exercised, but I think that can be unearthed with a little bit of effort. So whether it's music, dance, improv, um, painting, drawing, writing, creative writing, all these things are artistic expressions that are innate with our um, how we were created. And there are things that I think can add a lot of value to our lives. And then I say to people that, you know, the next most important thing is to surround yourself with people um, that will help encourage you um, and, and help you to believe in your own possibilities, even if it's just for yourself. If you write the, the world's great novel and tuck it away in your night table and no one ever sees it, that's fine. It isn't necessarily for public display. Um, it may become for public display that if you choose to do that, but I think the important thing is, is actually exercising creativity for your own sake. So just really quickly, because I do want to get onto painting. Um, here's a couple of additional paintings. Uh, my studio is set up in a gallery format so that people can come and see the work. The painting on the right here um, is a, the sister painting to this painting is hanging right now at the state capitol in the office of Senator Julie Gonzalez. Um, it was another one of those just opportunities that came about. I paint in all sizes of canvas. Um, these paintings here are some smaller paintings that I do. I started doing these when I started exhibiting at first Friday and third Friday in the art district. I found a lot of people came to the art walks 
not intending to haul out a you know 48 by 68 um, inch canvas. <laughs> um, they were looking for things that were prints and cards and smaller items to really make a, you know, an acquisition of an art piece that was easy to walk away with. And so what I began to do is create these smaller paintings that are very much in the same style of expression as my larger paintings, but in a very budget friendly and size friendly way. And these became very popular at the um, first Fridays. I sold a lot of these pieces. A lot of people told me they took them and put them in their work cubicles um, in small spaces in their homes or apartments. And um, it, they really became something that I really loved creating. I hate to waste paint. So a lot of times what I'll do is I will paint these smaller paintings as a result or consequence of the larger paintings. And this one, I'd give you an example is the same color palette as this painting here. And I bet if I look back in my journal, this painting, this small painting was probably made at the conclusion of this larger painting with the uh, remaining uh, paint on my palette. And so it's a little bit of economy. Something else that I do is I love to paint on photographs. And most often I love to do this with um, vintage photos. Um, and it's a technique of essentially just painting over photographs. And um, I do this with travel photos like this one. Um, I, I love horses. And so of course I do it with horse photographs. Um, here's a vintage uh, photograph of a bison. Um, and it's just another way or another means of expression um, that is uh, I think somewhat, somewhat unique. And is just something again that just feeds uh, my creative um, interpretation or interest. Uh, I love to be inspired by reading, so I do maintain uh, a small little library of books here in my studio. Uh, a lot of them are books on inspiration. Some of them are books um, that are based on uh, art. Uh, here's a Paulo Kahlo uh, book. Uh, I'm involved in the artist way right now, doing that with a friend. We're at week number eight. <laughs> and um, so, you know, these things are things that inform and inspire, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of my inspiration comes from things I read or interactions that I have. And those are just some examples of that. This is a show that I just um, took down that was at the Veterans Arts Council that's now just uh, you know, kind of resting on the rack for the opportunity to be shown again. Um, I do sell my works through my website. So, you know, that, that sometimes is the outcome. And then just have a number of my different paintings here around the studio space um, that if you come down, you'll be able to uh, take a look at. And this one in particular is an interesting painting, you know, the one in the center. It won the best of show at that first show that I um, presented at, at the Deep Space Gallery in Parker. And I've heard so many great interpretations of what people see in the movement in this piece. A lot of people see an angel right here, and I do too. <laughs> Um, so just to give you kind of a little bit of an idea of the diversity of color palette, diversity of technique, um, I'm really, I'm really, I'm trying to work towards a signature to where if someone walks in the room and sees a painting, they go, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a James Holmes painting. Um, so just trying to be consistent in the type of work that I do. And so I'll just give you an indication of a few of these paintings and what they look like. Sometimes I like to warm up my creative expressions by drawing. So this drawing table is where I do a lot of um, oil pastel drawing. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more geometric than my paintings. But again, I find it hard to get away from vibrant colors. And so there's an, a kind of an example of that. I am working on an interesting collaboration right now with a photographer here in Denver named Diane Allison. You can follow her on Instagram at, at photobrod. She's an excellent photographer. This is a photograph she took of a church in Colombia. And what I'm doing here is adding my paint over photograph, the same as the small photographs I just showed you, the same idea, but in a much larger format. I believe this is 38 inches by 46 inches, I believe. And so adding vibrant color and texture to a photograph. And uh, it's probably, just about maybe 20% complete. I've got a number of layers yet to put onto this, but this is gonna be for a public installation um, down in Rhino, and we'll leave it at that. But <laughs> more to come on that one, we'll say.
So let me come over here to my working space. So I want to show you just my working table. I love uh, golden paints. Um, over time, every artist ends up finding tools that they like better than others. Um, I love working with palette knives. When we talk about a palette knife, this is a great example. This is my favorite one. It looks the most used. The handle is full of paint. <laughs> and this would be my favorite palette knife for larger applications. And then, of course, my brushes, which I've got all kinds of brushes and other materials here. Um, when it comes to color palettes, I use these paper palettes. And I like to save. This is from a prior painting. I love to save the palette. So I have the colors if I ever need to recreate or repair something on a canvas. And so I individually use these sheets to lay out my colors and then save the sheets for another time, uh, just in case it's needed. So I'm going to come over here and put my camera onto uh, my stand here. And I'm going to share with you guys a little bit of a little painting demonstration. Um, I want to say to you, too, that in this period of time, uh, um, I think that, you know, anyone you know that's in the creative arts, uh, whether they work for an organization like, I, like Meredith mentioned, I work for Tier 3 Ranch and Castle Foundation, we are Tier 3. Um, you know, all of us, whether they're individual artists or someone working for an arts organization, absolutely can use your support. And that could mean if you're in a position to do so, to patronize those that are open or have an access point to be able to distribute their work. Um, just words of encouragement. It's a really tough time right now in the arts. And I really want to let you guys know that are on this call or this, this live stream today that are in the business community, your support of the arts is um, appreciated now more than ever. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, the shirt I'm wearing, because I know someone's going to ask about it, is um, piece one. This is a creation of a Denver uh, designer Mona Lucero is a friend of mine, and Mona Lucero has a shop that's over on 12th by the Art Museum. And um, I'm smiling because I tend to typically be wearing something that Mona designed whenever I see me talking about my art in public. So there you go. <laughs> so I'm going to put on uh, an apron here. We'll be mindful of the, of the time. And if there's any questions that you have while I'm doing this, please feel free to ask. And I'm going to see if I can make good use of the few minutes that we have left together. So this painting is one that I uh, began before. I'm going to go in, and this is a, a painting that was done uh, with brushes. And I let, sometimes let paint dry on brushes to create a really brittle, this happens to be the one I use, a really brittle surface. And so if you could see this painting a little more uh, closely in person, you'll notice there's a lot of what looks like scratch marks all over this painting. And that was done by using this dry brush. The tips are hard, and I'm able to straighten the paint across the canvas to um, create that effect. I am hard on canvases. When I get going um, in painting, um, I get lost in the um, understanding or interpreting the painting from the inside out. And so a lot of times, I will tend to lose, um, you know, just, I guess, conscious awareness of what's going on around me. And I just know a lot of times I'm really hard on my canvases. Um, this painting is one that I'm restarting. So I finished this painting, or at least I thought it was finished, um, about a year ago. I never really felt like it was fully evolved. And so I stare at this painting from time to time, waiting for the right moment to reapproach it, which is today. <laughs> so I'm going to come in here and just start actually uh, moving some Around. Painting and speaking and being aware of you guys being with me is, um, is not normal for me. And so um, what I'm going to try to do is make the paint around so I can just begin to get a little bit of a feeling of, of expression going on with this. The key to this process is not to be afraid of it. In other words, I don't want to be afraid that I'm going to mess something up because if I dig myself into a hole while I'm painting, I, I know I can get myself out there. So that's what we're going to do. And I'll post the thing when it's finished. Oh, yes. Can you hear me, James? Oh, we have a question here. I, I, yeah. how, do you, how do you know when a painting is done? And how do you know when a painting like this one is thought was done but wasn't done? A lot of times it comes down to satisfaction. And I have found that a lot of times I'll 
take a painting that I feel like is complete, and I'll go and I'll hang a show, like down at the Veterans Arts Council, and I'll look at the show, and that painting just bugs me a little bit. It just, I feel like it isn't, either I can't interpret what it is I was, I was communicating, um, painting from the inside out, or it just doesn't feel like it's at a level that I feel like I'm proud of it, being there on the wall. And, I, and I've had that happen a few times. It happened with this painting, which is why I, once the show was over and it was in, I put it away and figured I would come back to it at another time. And sometimes the paintings look completely different when they start once I've done that process. Um, I've had that happen too. And, um, it, and it just kind of is affirmation that, that that was right, that it really wasn't what it was intended to be. When I know a painting is right on the other side of that is when, uh, the thing I love to ask people, when they look at my work, because I like to say, what do you see in this? And I don't, I don't talk about what I see, unless I've already done so, I won't tell them the title that I give the painting, because I don't want to influence what they're going to think about the painting. But I want to hear about what they see in it, or how it makes them feel. Um, and based on the feedback I get, oftentimes I know a painting is done because of what is said. Like that person, like I mentioned that painting with the angel. That painting is called Returning the Muse. And um, when that interpretation of, I see an angel in that, I see the silhouette of a person, um, I see dynamic movement, I know that person is interpreting what was intended onto the canvas through my intention, because I know what conversation led to that piece. So that's how it happens oftentimes. So I'm coming through here now and just, um, and any other questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm just kind of, again, moving paint, trying to get into a uh, flow. I would normally be playing music right now, but I think um, I'm distracting for the broadcast. And so just layering, just layering color, trying to be mindful of what's already there. there are we have, a, of we, we have another have question. This is a, I, I love yeah. this question. Um, Diana wants to know, are you able to paint full time or how do you continue to balance your art and your business, your business positions? Boy, that is a great question. Um, because I'm the executive director of the foundation, um, I have a great team, first of all, uh, but I have a lot of responsibility. And my work ethic is kind of a 24 seven work ethic and it always has been that, even before I was doing, uh, trying to balance art in my professional life. Um, I've always kind of been that way. So in other words, um, I don't see start time, stop time, day of week. I see duties that need to be attended to and most importantly, deliverable. So, you know, we um, operate the foundation called board governance. And so I know very clearly what my responsibilities are and my accountabilities. And so I focus on that as number one to make sure I don't take this passion I have and stray away from being able to fill uh, my job, which I feel is an important job. Um, so most of the time I paint in the evening and I paint a lot on the weekends. And so the thing that really works best for me is if I can uh, kind of end my work day on a Friday around two o'clock or so, and I can basically try to balance in my personal life and my time painting over the next two and a half days. That gives me the most satisfaction. I live in Parker, the studio's in Denver, at least during the COVID period of time, traffic has not been a big problem, and for the most part. And I'm able to um, come down here sometimes at the end of the work day and spend two or three hours in the studio uh, painting during the week. Uh, but most of the time it's, it's Friday, late Friday afternoon or the evening, and Saturday and Sunday. And um, it's all a balancing act too. I do have, I will say this, I still have a easel, like this easel, and, and materials in my basement at home. And if I'm in a position where I can't get here for some reason, oftentimes I'll go downstairs and I'll paint um, if I feel like I, there's something I want to get out. This is, I have, this is a very CBCA question, but do you find that since you've started painting and since you've added this creativity and expression to your, to your life, has it had any impacts to your professional work? Do you find you're more creative or open-minded or how has there been um, a relationship there? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. And absolutely, um, the answer is yes. Um, I have found that my thought process around creativity has definitely influenced the way I make decisions in terms of our work at the foundation. Now, a big part of what we do involves creativity because we're a tier three, and so our arts and sciences component of our mission statement is definitely all about creativity. But I think just in terms of, even with analytical work, like problem solving, um, thinking about even like the COVID-19 experience as an example, and when we made the decision that we were gonna close the public, um, the public at first, it was temporary back in March, then making the decision to open back up and then reevaluating now we're closing until the end of the year. Making those decisions, um, I think being able to stop and, and imagine outcomes, um, you know, if A, <laughs> what does that mean towards the next decision? You know, what is that going to lead to? Um, thinking about um, ways of expressing what we're doing, just in terms of your messaging, um, being more exploratory with language. Um, if you would have received any of my uh, emails or any of our broadcasts around our closure, um, I wrote those uh, weekly uh, briefs that we were sending out, and they are very much crafted in a way that isn't real analytical. It's really more heart space. And so I feel like my creative expression and connecting with my creativity has definitely allowed me to communicate um, from a heart space position more effectively, both in my business and, of course, on the canvas as well. So, yes. So this uh, color I'm applying here is Pings Gray. Uh, it's not black and it's not really blue. And um, again, if I were painting alone solo, I probably wouldn't have a level of consciousness like that I have right now. And so I'm working through that. So I'll say that to you as an artist, I'm working through um, trying to continue to be a little unconscious about some of what I'm doing in order to allow it to be expressive, uh, which is my, again, my method. Hey James, this is I can t t see that you're you are so in the in the groove in the moment. Um, here I will I'll pop back on with my video. Um, is there anything you want to share with us before we we wrap up for today? Just the biggest thing I, I think that I'd like to leave as a message for all of you, and thanking you for taking the time to spend with us, is um, just encouragement. I want to encourage you if you have got in the back of your mind the idea around wanting to have creative expression as part of your life, or if you are currently a creative person, uh, just to fully embrace that. Um, I can't tell you, it would take probably the next six hours to explain the people, the uh, circumstances um, that have all been attracted into my life through my creative journey the last two years. And, you know, the thing about the accident that is really important as far as one of my takeaways is discovering my creativity, which wouldn't have happened, I don't believe, without that event, that life event, has allowed me to have no regrets about the accident. I mean, it, it has literally allowed me to, from an emotional, mental, psychological, and experiential perspective, to be just filled with gratitude. So I'm a big um, believer and want to be an encourager of you pursuing your artistic interests. Yeah, then the final thing is just continue to support artists. They really need it. Thank you so much. That is right. And actually, we already had someone pop up in the chat and say, this presentation has inspired me to pick up my paintbrushes again. So it's working. That is um, great. <laughs> Fantastic. You truly are an inspiration. Thank you, James, for, for sharing this time and being so open with us today. Um, it really was quite a treat. Uh, for those that are watching this video afterwards, um, this event uh, is something CBCA offers to our members, something like this, um, twice a month with our regular live lunch lounge series. Uh, next, uh, later this month, we're doing um, some dance and movement exercises with Celebrate the Beat. And then in September, we'll do some creative writing with Art from Ashes. We have Cleo Parker Robinson dance coming up. We have Modus Theater coming up. 
Um, and these events are normally exclusive to our CBCA members. So for the month of August and into the beginning of September, we're actually running a membership drive. So if you are a new member, you would like to bring this kind of exclusive, unique, behind the scenes, free arts experience to your, your company and your employees, join CBCA now and take advantage of a special uh, membership discount. We'd love to see you here on the second and fourth Friday of the month, uh, always at noon. Um, we wish you a wonderful rest of your Friday and weekend. Thank you again to James Holmes for sharing his beautiful work with us today. Uh, and we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Friday. Bye.